All right, uh, moving into chapter 23. Here we're going to be discussing the High Renaissance and Mannerism in Northern Europe and Spain. Spain is going to be separate than the rest of Northern Europe because it was the powerhouse of this time period. Uh, the Spanish conquistadors and finding their way over to what's considered the New World, the colonization of the Americas on the East, and all of that making its way and all the profits in which they obtained through their extreme and very strong military found its way back to Spain. So they have, <clears throat> during this time, their own um, kind of a cluster of power, so to speak, um, versus the rest of Europe. But that's what we're talking about. And it's uh, 1500 to 1600 CE. So this is kind of the Cinquecento of Northern Europe. We don't use that term, though, for Northern Europe because that's an Italian terminology uh, through the vernacular of the Italian intelligence um, during the Renaissance is what deems the 1500 to 1600 or 1599 as the cinquecento of italy so that would that's what differentiates it as southern italian renaissance versus that of the northern renaissance which is what we're going to discuss here in chapter 23. Um, so what's going to be happening in europe at this time is essentially the precursor arrangement of the countries that we see today so you're going to have, if you look at map 23.1, you can see the breakup of where the countries are. You have France, you have Spain, you have the what is the Holy Roman Empire, which is actually that of the Netherlands and that of Germany. Okay, so the Holy Roman Empire is still um, <clears throat> very influential, of course, in the makeup of what is present-day Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands in particular. Okay, so... Essentially, what's happening during this time, uh, 1500 to 1600, is what's going to lead into what's called an Enlightenment after the Baroque period. And that's going to be where the kingdoms break down and they become democratic countries. Um, so essentially, the, the makeup of the map that we're seeing now is what is going to be seen uh, in the very near future in the next couple hundred years. Um, let's see, uh, during this time, we've already mentioned in the past chapter that the Reformation and Counter-Reformation is occurring, and the Counter-Reformation was emphasized in Italy with the Papal States out of Rome, um, and again, that's the Catholic Church creating a Counter-Reformation against the Reformers or the Protestants, uh, built off of Martin Luther's statements of uh, more focus on on um, the humanism of spirituality versus that of buying spiritual indulgences and such. Essentially, the uh, Martin Luther and the Reformation was very unhappy with the acts of the Catholic Roman Church. So um, they created a Reformation which pushed against the Catholic Church and this battle between uh, the reformers and the counter-reformers are going to occur for a good hundred years. Um, now at the very beginning of the 1500s, the 16th century period here in Northern Europe, there's still going to be a heavy uh, commissioned emphasis from the Catholic Church, okay? So probably until about, what, 1580-ish, maybe 1570, it's going to be still commissioned by the Catholic Church, okay? But then, as we move away from the emphasis on Catholicism in Europe, in Northern Europe in particular, Spain separate, because Spain really remained a key factor in the promotion of Catholicism uh, around the world in particular, um, over into the Americas uh, during the colonial times as well. Um, they're going to carry Catholicism with them and, and be a huge military um, and, and, and inquisition uh, party for the Catholic Church. So that's again another reason why Spain is going to be uh, kind of its own little component during this time. Um, so, yeah. Um, so around 1570 is when you're going to start to see Northern European paintings move away from Catholicism 
uh, Catholic based themes in imagery and more into secular based themes in imagery and in parables in particular and how everyday different um, uh, people in society focus on their religiosity based off of their secular activities like their their day-to-day -day work all right so that's going to change at around 1570 to 1580 I'll go into that more specifically. Um, but even, and this goes with anything in the arts, whenever there's heavy conflict and strife, now remember the reformers or the Protestants and the Catholics were fighting amongst each other for about a hundred years. And you would think that there won't be much art when there's all this battling and, you know, and questioning corruption or the corruption. I forgot what it is that I read the other day, but uh, you know, a corrupt tree cannot produce good fruit and a good tree cannot produce corrupt fruit. So it's kind of like that. One's calling the person corrupt, the other's calling them corrupt, back and forth. Um, but with that, with the Counter-Reformation and the Reformation, there's actually going to be an increase in intelligence and art during this time. There's going to be an interest in schooling with new themes with these new sciences that were coming out of the southern renaissance and then also more artwork becoming more prominent during this time so even though even though there is this battling going on this religious upheaval and fervor of attacking one another the artwork that's coming out of it at this time is still very very strong and the intelligence behind it you know the rational naturalism that in the mathematics and the new sciences that are coming out and coupled with the art is is really strong in Europe as well. Now, one thing that is going to be very different in the Northern European um, artwork that is also uh, commissioned by the Catholic Church or commissioned by uh, secular rich merchants is that it's still going to be more about Christian Orthodox themes. It's going to be there's going to be some emphasis on the Greco-Roman interest that the Southern Italian Renaissance artists liked, um, but there's going to be less of that. It's going to definitely be more about the um, the religious themes of Christian Orthodox, uh, well, Judaism or in Christianity in particular. All right, so there's going to be some main areas I want to talk about. We're going to talk about Germany, we're going to talk about the Netherlands, and then we're going to talk about Spain. So those are the three main areas. And um, in within Germany, we're going to talk about Grunwald, and we're also going to talk about Dreher, and then um, Kranich the Elder, and then in the Netherlands, which was which was actually ran by Spain, King Philip II. He uh, also governed the Netherlands at this time. Um, we're going to talk about Bosch. We're also going to talk about Bruegel the Elder. And then in Spain itself, we're going to talk about El Greco. Right? So those are the main areas we're going to discuss. <laughs> Again, I just have to emphasize to you all that each one of these chapters that we're talking about could be a whole semester. Easily could be a whole semester. I once took in, in college a class that was 17 weeks long that was just about Greek and Roman art. That's it. Nothing else. Just Greek and Roman. There's so much, um, there's so much rich information. So we'll try to tackle as much as we can. Um, all right. So let's begin in Germany. And in Germany, we're going to start with figure 23.2 and it's going to be Grunwald and it's the Eisenheim altarpiece. And this actually was commissioned by the uh, the Catholic commissioners. Okay, so the Catholic Church commissioned this painting series of panels on top of an already um, developed sculpture, um, a relic or an altarpiece sculpture. And these paintings became panel doors to this uh, piece of sculpture. And it's pre-Reformation, so this is before. Northern Europe decided to bring upon this Reformation and attack the uh, the Catholic Church for um, for falsification of religiosity and many other different factors that Martin Luther pinned 99 theses upon the Catholic Church to indicate what was wrong with the Catholic Church. So this is predating that, but it's getting ready to happen. It's getting ready to happen. Um, so anyway, this was commissioned by the Catholic Church 
um, the Eisenheim altarpiece. One one term that's new. It's called a poly um, a polytic, and that's spelled P O L Y P T Y C H. Let me spell that again. P O L Y P T Y C H. And what that means is it has multiple. Is more than three panels. Okay, so it has one, two, three, four. Um, that open up and it's multi-paneled and um, and when you have um, when you have two it's called a diptych when you have three it's called a triptych and when you have more than three it's called a polyoptic and that so that is specifically what type of tick uh, this is what type of a compositional arrangement of panels it is and that's what we talk about not the painting itself but how many panels it takes to make the overall composition um, it still has um, the Catholic some Catholic symbolism in it which lets us know is the evidence that this is uh, still commissioned by the Catholic Church you have the Roman numerals on the on the stake um, above Christ's head in the center on the during the crucifixion, so those uh, those Roman numerals are an indicator of the you know the Roman Catholic Church, and also the lamb in the blood in the chalice, which is down to the bottom left of Jesus. That symbol of that cross that's been stabbed through the uh, aorta, not the aorta, but the uh, jugular of the lamb is that sacrificial symbol of the Lamb of God or the Son of God being sacrificed for the sins of others. Um, the ransom, I believe it's what it's called. Um, so that is a symbol that we're not going to see really be used in the rest of the um, Northern European Renaissance paintings during this time as we move through the Reformation. Uh, these Catholic symbolisms are going to slowly start to move away. And more of the Northern European symbolisms that we saw in chapter 21, like with Van Eyck and all the hidden symbols and the Flemish painters and how they use different symbols to represent different parts of biblical narratives in the Bible, that's going to start to be revitalized. Not, not the Catholic symbols and the lamb with the blood um, oozing into the chalice um, is, is, is definitely ca um, a Catholic uh, symbol. Um, again, these are panels that are painted for an existing altar. This altar piece already existed, and um, these are being painted um, on top of this altar piece to, to cover up the, the, the sculptural figures with, with these paintings. Um, and a couple things that's going to be two things that are going to be very um, present in northern renaissance painters is one more atmosphere or more environment surrounding the figures as you can see in all the panels there's more of an environment you have architectural elements on the top of figure 23.2 where it's closed and um, then the main scene with Jesus being crucified, there's more of a, an, an ominous background that's opening up into this environment, this nature-like environment. And that's going to become more prevalent. And you can see it as you drop down on the bottom image where the panels are opening with St. Anthony. And you can see that the imagery in the background is flooded with nature. Okay, in the distortion and the torment to the right, as well as the discussion of um, of healing and illness there on the on the left. But environment and atmosphere is going to become very prominent with the Northern European painters versus the Southern European Renaissance painters. Um, the other is what I mentioned before, and that's called a uh, horror vacui. All right, horror vacui. H o r r o r fear of. Um, and then vacui is of, um, of empty space. So there's a fear of having empty space. So you can see the environment when it's open with the bottom image is flooded with St. Anthony on both sides. It's flooded with this environment. And you're going to see that become more and more prominent as we move through the European um, uh, Renaissance, Northern European Renaissance painters here. Um, it's also, it's plain, and so 
the Catholic Church, as we saw with the Last Judgment, with Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, is really playing on emotions and the power of God's order, almost less wrath. So there's a dire uh, focus on illness but recovery with St. Anthony in the lower section in particular. Um, and that's because of disease that was happening at this time. And it's showing that through surrender with the Catholic Church in particular, you can be healed of these diseases. So the miracles um, that were given to St. Anthony from, from Christ and from God are being depicted here. So you go through these dire illnesses, which is disease, but then you can come out clean and recovered in the end through your uh, focus in religiosity, i.e. Catholic Church. Um, so that's being presented here as an emotional slant, which is something that is not Greco-Roman, but it is definitely more medieval. So some of these elements of emotion in the Byzantine as well are finding their way into, into these uh, Northern European paintings. <clears throat> um, yeah, so the themes of St. Anthony um, are depicting that, which is in the very bottom with it opened up to the far left and to the far right. Um, now, what's happening visually is we have a contrast of subtle tones and against shocking dissonance of color. So if you zoom in at those St. Anthony panels and you can see that there is a contrast between like subtle tones of color and value and how that's up against really shocking sudden shifts of color. Like you'll go from a cool color to a sudden shift of warm color. All right. And when it's closed, it's a lot of warm colors like the robes with the image up top with all of these uh, heavy earth and, and, and brown tones that are happening with Christ and in the environment. And suddenly you open it and it's all these really cool colors with the blue robe of St. Anthony and all the de, um, distortion that's happening to the far right with St. Anthony being tormented with really heavy uses of warm colors. So he's disjointing the coloration um, for, with subtle tones within the colors and then this shocking, again, dissonance, meaning it's broken. It's disjointed. A dissonance is a sudden sharp up or a sudden drop in flat with musical sound. And we're doing it, he's doing it visually to suddenly spark up to a bright warm color or drop down into a quick cool color. All right. So just think of cool colors like greens and blues, like a, a flat in a song. And then warm colors are like a, a sharp in a song. And so that's what he's doing. He's doing this kind of musical arrangement of sharp and flat using uh, sharp warm colors like reds and oranges and yellows and then cool colors uh, for flats like greens and blues and in brown tones kind of neutralizing all of it okay kind of tying it all together all right so now let's look at Drurer and we're going to look at figure 23.4 and um, real quick background with Drurer is he was an engraver and an etcher um, for his father, who was a goldsmith. And what Drurer did, he was a good painter. You can look at figure 23.3 to get an idea of his sophistication in painting, as well as uh, figure 23.6. But we're not going to discuss his paintings uh, because we don't have a lot of this during this time. And it's called printmaking, also known as graphic arts graphic arts so we're talking so much about painting and sculpture and architecture as we don't get a discussion very much about graphic arts print making and um, what he did is he created these prints and most of these prints were for for uh, specifically for books illustrations for books but he also created singular sheets of prints and sold them to everyday people like you and me. So he tapped into a market by dropping the price of single sheets of artwork that people could place into their homes versus it going to people that were super, super wealthy or the churches or the Catholic church. So those patrons received the bigger paintings and the bigger uh, commissions of him doing multiple images for books and such. But 
he was able to get these prints into the hands and into the homes of the everyday folks. So he tapped into a market that made him super wealthy and it got art spread throughout all different uh, levels of society, which is really great. Um, <clears throat> so graphic arts, so he helped invent uh, graphic arts. And another thing that he really focused on, which is again, this very European style, Northern European Renaissance style is that horror vacui. So you will see with the, we're gonna look at a, um, uh, how many prints? I think we're just gonna look at one print, but you can look at a series of prints and you can see how he fills the space. There is like hardly any area in the composition that doesn't have some kind of activity that's going on. Now how he does this is called engraving or etching. And he uses a tool that he learned from his father in the goldsmithing trade called a burin, B-U-R-I-N, B-U-R-I-N. And what he did is he'll take a plate, copper typically, or zinc, and he'll cut into the surface and create lines, okay? And where he cuts into the surface the deepest is where the darker lines are going to be on the print. And what we see in the print, like figure 23.4, Fall of Man, Adam and Eve, is the reverse of how he made it. So he has his plate, and he has to reverse the image. So actually, Adam, who's to the left, is going to be carved in reverse to the right. And then the paper goes on top, it's rolled through, and then it will transfer over to look like this. So Adam will become on the left. Eve will be on the right, even though she's etched on the left of the plate. So it's like a mirror reflection. You have to do everything backwards on the plate, which is what makes it very difficult. And then when you put the paper on there and you look at the paper, that's the, that's the reverse positive. And so by reverse, by positive and negative, when you're carving deep into the plate with the burr in, that gives you your darker lines. And then whenever you barely etch the surface with the burr in, that creates your soft highlights. So you get your chiaroscura or your transition between light and dark based off of how deep you carve into that plate. Because the ink will lay deeper into that plate and it will barely hover on the surface whenever you have small little incisions into the plate. All right, so that makes the light line by barely cutting it and the heavy dark line um, by carving into it even deeper. Okay, and that's how printmaking works, at least in regards to the etching process, okay, etching process, or also known as engraving, all right, engraving. So this is the fall of man, and again, he learned as a goldsmith by using the burin. Um, it, he, was, he was known for his book illustrations, so all of these actually went into books, okay, so your everyday uh, uh, books that that were part of the secular society that were not just hidden in a in a church or this or that it was available for all to see, uh, but the images were uh, were mostly for more of the intelligent class. Um, but he again he did sell everyday uh, prints for people. Okay, so it was really great. Now he did. He did travel a lot, and he studied in Italy. He went down uh, during the height of the Italian Renaissance, and he learned. And he learned in particular from Leonardo. And what he learned from Leonardo is that Vitruvian uh, arrhythmic uh, formula of the body. And so as we noted, Leonardo would find a way to create a proportionate figure based off of the old Greek-Roman uh, mathematical formulas like finding um, order in nature right that was very much the southern renaissance mentality is finding order in nature and so uh, Dürer did that he went and he studied in Florence and he learned about this uh, arithmetic ratio and so these figures of Adam and Eve fit that southern renaissance coming from the Greek antiquity uh, mathematical formula that Leonardo used and then Dürer learned how to do it through um, indirectly through Leonardo while he was in Italy and then brought it up into the northern European areas and so these bodies of Adam and Eve are a rhythmic ratio a rhythmic ratio called the Vitruvian V-I-T-R-U-V-I-A-N okay 
And not only are they is he tapping into the antiquity of the Southern Renaissance in Italy from antiquity from the Greeks, but also the 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 uh, even though this is Adam and Eve Christian Orthodox, it is a discussion on um, an old Greek um, um, connection between the classical Apollo and Venus. So Adam is supposed to reflect the Apollo figure of Greece. And then Eve is supposed to reflect the Venus figure of Greece, right? So that's a Greco-Roman influence right there. And remember, when we're talking about the influence, uh, or talking about the Renaissance, we're talking about the influence of Greco-Roman styles. That's what Renaissance means, the rebirth of antiquity. So when we're looking at these pieces, we're trying to find where uh, that Greco-Roman influence is. <clears throat> um, now, how we know that this is that arithmetic ratio, that Vitruvian ratio, is um, the balance between the two contrapostos. So you have the contraposto that's also present here. Um, and Adam is shifting in one direction towards his left, and Eve is shifting in the opposite direction towards her right. So it creates these two ratio curves of contraposto, which balances out the composition. So each individual has that uh, Vitruvian uh, formula or ratio in its proportion in the body, both Adam and Eve, but then also coupled together, they create this uh, waving parallel composition between the two contrapostos. Um, but again, because we're in Northern Renaissance, there's a huge focus on nature. So by that hora vacui, you can see behind them is, is paradise and it's completely flooded with uh, imagery. Like you have the trees, you have the landscape, you have all these different symbolic animals that are present. And the main one is the cat and the mouse on the bottom in that you have the pounce and the attack that's getting ready to happen because this is just before they fall from grace, okay? This is happening just before the bite of the apple. Uh, so the symbols are uh, presented there. Uh, with the animals. And that's something that's very Northern European. We saw it with the Flemish painters, right? The late and early Flemish painters in chapter 21. And it was a discussion on how different symbols reflect different uh, biblical aspects. Okay, so these animals are reflecting that as well. <clears throat> and, and each one has a different symbolic representation in, <clears throat> in the fall of man and woman from, from the Garden of Eden. All right. So let's see, what time do we have? Do, 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 do. I'm going to do one more, and then I'll do another video that covers the, ne that covers the Netherlands and Spain. And so I'll finish up with, um, with Germany here in this one. So we're going to look at um, Kronach the Elder, and the figure number that I want you to look at is 23.8. Lucas Kronach the Elder. And the elder typically means the like father and then the younger means like or not father but the like a, a family of uh, purine painters or artists and the elder is the one that came first and then the younger would be somebody else in the family that came later it could be a the son it could be the daughter it could be a cousin that came later <clears throat> okay so um, one thing that we need to know about Cronach the Elder in particular is that he was the biggest painter of support of the Reformation. So now we're moving into the Reformation during the 30s here, the 1530s, and uh, he is a great buddy of uh, Martin Luther, who's the one who helps establish and get the Reformation against the Catholic Church going. And so he becomes the painter of the Reformation. He's known as the painter of the Reformation. And what's going to happen with the Reformers, the Protestants, is they are going to shift a focus on decoration and an emphasis on images of God and Jesus in their paintings. They're not going to focus on that. They're not going to do that because they fear the decoration is too ornamentalized and uh, the presence of Jesus and God in the paintings distracts you away from your worship of going to church and speaking with God directly. So they're omitting those things, the reformers. They're omitting the decorations. They're keeping them austere and more bare. And they're focusing on um, not 
depicting Christ or Jesus and God in the paintings versus the Catholic Church are doing the complete opposite. They're highly ornamentalizing and creating uh, lots of decoration in their artwork as well as heavily focusing on God and Jesus in their work. Okay, so now we're at a time where we're shifting away from all of the the the, the Catholic emphasis and we're moving more into the secular reformer or Protestant uh, styles. Okay, and Cronach the Elder is one of the first to do that. <clears throat> um, and he was known for providing the imagery that Martin Luther needed in his book. So Martin Luther put a book, you know, Bible a book together, um, emphasizing the importance of the Bible separate from the Catholic version. Okay, um, so he, uh, Cronach the Elder, would provide the images and the paintings that Martin Luther needed for the Reformation for that you know period of time. Uh, when it was you know, Protestants versus you know Catholics. So we're going to talk about the judgment of Paris, and we're going to see how there is still the emphasis on the Greco-Roman style, but then also how it's becoming more secular, uh, which we'll see even more so here um, in the Netherlands um, here in just a, in the next video. So with the judgment of Paris, this actually is a Greco-Roman story, and um, what it is is it's um, it's it's Mercury uh, choosing Paris, okay, who's the one seated. Paris is the one seated. And in this depiction, Mercury is the one standing, leaning over to him. Um, and how the story goes is he's asking Paris to judge a beauty contest between these three, these three ladies. And um, the three ladies are Juno, the son of Jupiter, or the daughter of Jupiter, Minerva, and then also Venus. And whoever wins uh, becomes is the most beautiful, right, out of the three. Well, what happens is Venus, um, she wins by depicting herself as the Lady of Helen. And the Lady of Helen um, is considered one of the most beautiful of women in the material world um, during that during the Greek time. And she is the, and because of that, that's what creates the Trojan War. So by Venus depicting herself as Helen through this illusion, it creates a debacle which leads to the Trojan War, Greeks versus the Trojans. And um, that is what sets up Homer's The Iliad. So that's the Greco Roman narrative behind this painting. Now, the depiction is very unconventional. It is not your standard depiction of that story leading up to Homer's The Iliad. Um, the difference is, is that it's very Northern European. You have a Germanic-like castle in the background in the far distance. You have suits of armor. Mercury is older versus he's typically depicted um, as a young, vibrant, virile character but here he's uh, he's older and we know the divinity versus the secular being or the temporal being Paris as the temporal because he has his cladded uh, suited feet um, upon the ground and then the rest of a mercury and then the three ladies are all barefoot and barefoot is a typical indicator of divinity like being barefoot on the ground with these depictions all the way back to the Greco-Roman times. All right. So it's very Northern Europe with the landscape and again, covering the uh, composition with all of this landscape um, and this atmosphere of natural environment is very Northern European. It is not Greco-Roman. It is not Southern Renaissance. It's very Northern Renaissance. Um, Mercury is old. Um, and also the thing with the three ladies is that they do not follow that Greek proportion style like we saw with Dürer with that arithmetic ratio. They do not follow that. They actually have more manneristic styles to them. Small heads, longer bodies, okay? So that's something that's very manneristic, which is going to become very prominent here in the Northern Euro 
Europe section. So you can see, you should be able to note what is very Northern European about it, with the atmosphere, the use of mannerism, the change of imagery with the figures versus that which is Greco-Roman, uh, which is the story itself, which leads to the Iliad by Homer. All right. Okay, I'll leave it at that, and then we'll jump into the Netherlands and Spain here in just uh, in the in the next video.